Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to hearing number 18 of the 181st period of sessions. I would like to welcome the representatives of the state and the civil organizations here. And also, I would like to greet the colleagues that are here with me today. Today, we are going to discuss the situation of human rights uh, justice operators and in the judicial independence in Guatemala. This hearing was requested by the um, human rights ombudsman in Guatemala together with other civil society organizations. Uh, in this hearing, civil society organizations will have 20 minutes to point out or to explain the situation. Then at the state, we have another 20 minutes. And after that, the members of the Inter-American Commission will have 20 minutes uh, to make observations or to ask questions. And after that, each of the parties will have 12 minutes for the final comments. Today with me are, I'm having some connectivity issues, so I cannot see others, but today with me are the second vice president of the commission, Commissioner Flavia Piovesan, country reporter, uh, and Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena Troitinio, and Commissioner Joel Hernandez, that is also the reporter for justice operators and human rights defenders. Also, today with me are the teams uh, or the member of the team of the Executive Secretariat, together with the Executive Secretary Tania Renault, the Assistant Executive Secretary Maria Claudia Pulido, and the team that is helping us to conduct this hearing. I hope I don't have other connectivity issues. But please, I will make a special request to my colleagues. Please continue the meeting if I uh, got a lost connection, lose connection. Um, on the screen, you will have a clock. Can you see it? Please, can you confirm? Please uh, nod if you can see it. And the clock will be running and it will turn red when you have only three minutes left. Please. Uh, try to use time responsibly so that I don't have to interrupt you. In addition, I will request you to mute yourselves when you are not taking the floor. Now I would like to give the floor to civil society for 20 minutes and after to the state. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Good morning, Madam President. My name is Jordan Rodas Andrade. I'm Human Rights Ombudsman of Guatemala. I would like to thank you for your concern regarding the situation of our country. It's not a coincidence that we are just here. As we have been discussing this with you, we are seeing a process of co-opting by the state. We see that there is a perverse situation. We have a situation that is worse than the one we had before 2015. Today with me, I am accompanied by Erika Fagan, high-risk judge, Juan Francisco Sandoval, former prosecutor of the Special Prosecutor Office against impunity, Jorge Santos, and Claudia Pasipas from the Hill. The Guatemalan justice system is undergoing an extremely worrying crisis. Uh, some groups in, or in their interest to ensure impunity and to perpetuate the mechanisms of corruption have implemented a strategy, the co-optation co of the justice system, and they are systematic attacking the work of independent uh, officials. This weakens the rule of law and the protections of citizens' rights, and especially uh, the fight to protect human rights becomes harder. The work carried out by the commission together with CICIG, uh, for show that there was a strengthening of the justice and democratic system through the investigation conducted by FESI in order to criminally prosecute criminal structures that were embedded in state institutions. As a result of the non-renewal of the C6 mandate in 2019, reprisals again and retaliations against uh, officials of the public prosecutor office and other uh, high level judges uh, uh, increased. Currently, the justice system is 
in a crisis that is aimed at obstructing the investigation and punishment of cases of corruptions and serious human, serious human rights and to guarantee impunity. That's what they want. Since 2019, uh, the election of the Supreme Court of Justice and the appeals chamber was delayed. And this it goes against uh, the justice system as a whole. We are seeing that there are different criminal, economic, and groups uh, and other groups who are trying to persecute uh, justice operators in order to delegitimize and to obstruct their work and to separate them from their positions and to prosecute them criminally so that um, everything, all this situation goes again, uh, is not positive. Now I would like to give the floor to Erika Ifan. Honorable commissioners, on behalf of the independent judges of Guatemala, I would like to expose the serious violations of human rights that we are suffering in retaliation for our work against corruption and impunity. I would like to show my concern for those risks that are a situation of highest risk. Pablo Citumul, Miguel Ángel Galvez, and Jasmin Barrios, who have been granted precautionary measures by this commission. On a daily basis, we face systematic attacks by groups that consider themselves affected by our work of important justice. We receive constant threats against our lives and physical integrity and that of our families. We receive message of hatred, discredit. We are harassed. We are subject to surveillance and monitoring with vehicles without license plates. We are attacked as women. We are also subjected to unfounded criminalization processes. We receive constant at attacks on social media by fake accounts of net centers that are connected to the government that use reference to times of internal armed conflict in which forced disappearances, kidnapping, torture cases, and deaths were conducted with impunity. On those messages, we are labeled as guerrilla members. They show instruments used for torture and revenge for the fight against corruption. Usually these net centers have information that is confidential and some acts are announced and those acts are effectively executed by the state, such as the issues of arrest warrants, the stripping of immunity and sentences or judgments to exile. Another way of attacking us is by infiltrating their personal in our courts. They leak information, they watch us, they spy us, they record and steal proceedings and files. We are also subjected to several unfounded criminal and administrative uh, complaints. Up to now, there are for over 40 criminal complaints against for higher uh, judges that are at the highest risk, such as one that is from 2012. Together with other three judges, we have gone to the attorney general to request the final resolution of these unfounded cases. However, over three months after our request, there has been no response. The strategy of filing pretrials is the most commonly used strategy to strip us of our immunity and to imprison us or to force us to exile given the fact that we cannot exercise our right to legitimate this defense. In these trials, the Supreme Court is usually formed without following the due process of law. And there are no uh, processes or evidence against that us. Faced with the circumstances, the public prosecutor office and the high courts have been ineffective in guaranteeing our life, physical and emotional integrity, and the respect for our judicial independence. We have presented several violations of our rights, which have been dismissed and closed. And these investigations have been used only to obtain information about our security schemes. After several years, the perpetrators of these crimes have not been identified. And there are no investigations regarding infiltrations in our courts. In addition, the complaints that we have filed due to the threats and the surveillance to which we are subjected are not being investigated and are closed without a good reason. The actions that we bring brought, that we bring before the constitutional court to guarantee our rights are being manipulated to review our ordinary jurisdiction in high impact cases. We have thought 
uh, mutual support by after, with the creation of the Guatemalan Association of Judges for Integrity. We have made complaints, petitions, proposals for legal reforms. We have filed appeals and remedies to defend judicial independence. As a result of this, the association is being attacked and is being uh, accused of several actions. This pattern of criminalization is a vicious cycle in which once a complaint has been filed and other complaints are being filed. All these situations put our lives and our personal integrity at a serious risk and also violate people's right to independent justice. Given the regional context of violation of judicial independence, I express before you my deep concern, and I ask you to make a strong call to the state of Guatemala to stop the criminalization of judges so that we can carry out our work of impartially imparting justice and, the and defending the rights of all people. I would like to give the floor to Juan Francisco Sandoval. Ilustre Comisión, yo expondré sobre los retrocesos del Ministerio Mr. Público. Commission, I will speak about the setbacks in the in my office in the fight against corruption and impunity, as well as the dangers to which prosecutors in charge of these types of investigations are subjected. Since the arrival of the current Attorney General Consuelo Porras, multiple strategies have been implemented to hinder the investigation work, especially in cases under the responsibility of the PESI. An example of this is the internal order issued by the Attorney General subjecting the support of the National Civil Police to her direct authorization, preventing immediate and direct access to that institution. The movement and transfer of personnel between departments, as well as the incorporation of prosecutors with clear legal impediments to lead investigations, is used by the Attorney General to hinder investigative work. One of the most serious actions is the convenient transfer of FESI investigations to other prosecutors' office when the person under the investigation is the President of the Republic or people close to him. I have documented at least 24 times in which the Attorney General sought to expedite some investigation to prosecute her adversaries and, on the contrary, to stop investigations that were linked to state agencies. So I will file the corresponding actions at the appropriate time in order to delegitimize the anti-corruption fight against, uh, sorry, um, the, the personnel. There are massive complaints, which usually come from private actors, such as the Foundations Against Terrorism or former public officials investigated by this office. In reprisal for my work, I was illegally dismissed and criminalized and forced to exile as would I would have no guarantee to exercise my legitimate right of defense. So far, 12 people have had to go into exile, eight prosecutors and four judges and magistrates. There are currently about 68 known complaints against me and about 30 against the FESI staff. The investigations against us are being expedited in a privileged manner, as evidenced by the arrest warrant issued against me almost immediately after my dismissal. In these proceedings, our right to, to defense is violated. The complaints are processed anonymously. That is contrary to the legislation in force. In my particular case, most of these cases do not appear in the registry of the information system of the public ministry, and I am not allowed to access them. There is constant pressure on prosecutors to process complaints and complaints against staff who remain independent of the attorney general. Proof of that is that those who dismiss complaints against me and did not agree to request an array warrant against me due to their uh, clear inappropriateness did not have their contracts renewed. On the other hand, the complaints filed by FESI personnel for crimes committed against them are ignored by the public prosecutor's office and the attorney general. Defamation and stigmatization and for the criminalization is a constant part pattern that is worrying, as most of them are carried out through social media, and they seek to disqualify and de delegitimize the work of our offices. These accounts, including that of the Foundation Against Terrorism, have access to confidential information from the public prosecutor's office, which allows them to announce in advance actions such as arrest warrants and other actions by the judiciary. And this is evidence of an articulated strategy between certain private groups and the public authorities. Assaults by state officials against justice officials have an impact 
on the public confidence in the justice system. Those who have the duty to protect officials are the ones who attack them. An example of this are the statements made by the attorney general in a press conference in which she assures that there were illegal actions by the FESI. There's also concern in the lack of protection for active FESI staff who continue to work on high impact cases while their personal security has been withdrawn by the direct orders of uh, Consuelo Porras. Honorable Commission, the situation is serious. The prosecutor's staff, office is, staff is afraid. The strategy is to criminalize us in order to force us into exile. The lack of independence of the public prosecutor's office is evident to the point that Ms. Porras has been included by the US government in a list of officials linked to corruption and the public prosecutor's office has uh, been withdrawn its cooperation. Now I give the floor to Jorge Santos. Good morning, honorable commission. The human rights situation in Guatemala is worsening rapidly. The escalation of attacks against human rights defenders is increasingly visible. The Registry of the Protection Unit for Human Rights Defenders in Guatemala reports 755 cases of aggression so far in 2021, of which 189 were against justice operators, including harassment and threats on social networks. The most attacked groups are justice officials, defenders of the right to access justice, journalists, and social communicators. The level of violence against defenders is reflected in the three attempts and 10 murders of defenders of sexual diversity, peasants, and social communicators. In addition, the Human Rights Ombudsman's Office is in grave danger due to the constant attempts to remove the current ombudsman, as well as the lack of delivery of the budget allocated by the Congress. Which, it, which in itself has been reduced since 2018. Congress disobeys the resolution of the Constitutional Court that ordered the allocation of the money, which suffocates the institution with a, with a deficit of over $2 million and affects about 701 workers who cannot receive their income. This prevents the constitutional mandate of the PDH endangering its independence and the population's access to justice. Furthermore, we are concerned that during this government, 15 states of exception have been implemented and an excessive use of force has been made against indigenous and peasant communities defending their territories. As is currently happening in the Quechi communities. Now I will give the floor to Claudia Pasipas to present our petitions. Good morning, Madam President. Good morning, Honorable Commission. For everything we have said, we request this Honorable Commission to follow up on the alarming situation of risk faced by judges, magistrates, and prosecutors and order the state to immediately and permanently cease the strategies of harassment, persecution, and judicial harassment, reminding it of its duty to warranty the independent exercise of the jurisdictional function, to urge the public prosecutor's office to cease criminalization against justice officials, including those in exile, ensuring an impartial review and dismissing all unfounded prosecutions. The attorney general should be reiterated her duty not to maliciously use the criminal justice system to limit judicial action and in turn to warranty judicial independence and impartiality. The public prosecutor's office is also urged to investigate all complaints filed by justice officials for acts that violate their rights. We also would like the commission to urge the state to stop using impeachment proceedings as a tool of harassment to maliciously lift the judicial immunity of justice officials in retaliation for their work, as were the cases against Judge Erika Ifan and Judge Pablo Chitimul. Also to urge the Congress to immediately elect 
high courts in accordance with the criteria of suitability and objectivity, for which we ask the Commission to move forward diligently with the processing of the case of Anavil Maguias and others, because they um, have to do with parallel commissions. And given the accelerated worsening of the situation for justice operators, and in order to avoid irreparable damage to life, integrity, and judicial ind independence, we request that the Inter-American Court to grant provisional measures when the situation so warrants. We also request commission that you urge the Congress to immediately comply with the obligation to provide the Human Rights Ombudsman's Office with the corresponding budget to remind the state of its reinforced duty to protect human rights defenders and to give continuity to the construction of a comprehensive policy for the protection of human rights defenders. Honorable Commission, we also call for an end to the criminalization and repression against indigenous and peasant communities. We suggest or we request that uh, Guatemala is included in chapter four of its annual report. And finally, we urge the commission to require the state to warranty the security and integrity of all persons who have participated in this hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, defenders and representatives from the civil society, judges and magistrates who have uh, pronounced their statements. Now I will give the floor for 20 minutes to the state. Thank you very much. Good morning, illustrious members of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, ladies and gentlemen, from the um, requesting party and everyone here at this hearing, I cordially greet you. And I would like to present the delegation of the state of Guatemala. It is presided by the Presidential Commission for Peace and Human Rights. We also have the um, public prosecutor and representatives of these institutions, the Ministry for Government, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, the Supreme Court of Justice. In accordance to the good faith and support that have always been there in the relationship with the Inter-American Commission, we come here to listen and have a constructive and enriching in dialogue for both parties. But it is important to emphasize that the state does not accept this forum to be used to blame internationally. That is why we urge everyone to observe the norms and the principles of the inter-American system. That is why we request that the information you provided against our nation is not um, doctored. Guatemala is a democratic state that ensures all its citizens the exercise of its rights and its freedoms. It respects its rule of law and its institutions. Now we will listen to Mr. Walter Bertrán. Thank you, Mr. Director. First, with regards to the fight against corrupt, corruption and impunity, it's important to say that the International Commission Against Impunity was working to strengthen the institutions in the state who are in charge of criminal prosecution. And it was a temporary institution. That is why its mandate ended in, in 2019. And before that, its capabilities were transferred to the uh, public prosecutor's office. That is because the fight against corruption is part of a strategic plan against corruption. And it is a public commitment the head of that sector has uh, undertaken and has implemented several sections. She created a special, uh, she transformed the FESI prosecutor's office and transformed it into one of the uh, offices that now work against corruption. By incorporating FESI to this larger structure meant to the disarticulation of criminal structures and many, many cases that were prosecuted. FESI was also strengthened with a technical support unit made up of investigators, criminal and financial analysts, and 
support staff apart from its original members 142 people apart from 11 investigators 10 anal uh, criminal analysts 10 um economic analysts and several investigators and supervisors and other investigators from the civil police this office has security structures to protect its members and that is determined by the department of security and apart from that we are talking about an institution made up of uh, staff that is highly committed to the citizens of Guatemala with a presence in 340 municipalities. With that in mind, we should remind you that 276 fiscal agencies were um, inaugurated during the past few years and the investigations are institutional. They are in charge of a working group, not a public prosecution's office. The fight against corruption and impunity remains an important task for the entire sector in all of its bodies, in all at all government levels, with the participation of over 10,000 collaborators. Now, with regards to the removal of Mr. Uh, Sandoval, we must say that he is using the ordinary and constitutional remedies in Guatemala, requesting for the uh, return of his position. He also promoted a writ of amparo, saying, arguing that uh, the head of the public prosecution was against him. On August 17 of that year, Mr. Sandoval presented a lawsuit at the labor sector of justice requesting his uh, reintegration to his position. And even though it is known that he is not in the Republic of Guatemala, he still has security, uh, a security team and even uh, a vest, a, bull, uh, a vest against bullets to protect him. And we, the government, sorry, the state is also protecting the parents of Mr. Sandoval. Now, with regards to the magistrates of the Constitutional Court, the entire Congress sworn in in 2021, the uh, magistrates who are part of the eighth magistrate's office for 2021, 2026, in accordance with Article 269, these professionals are now part of this eighth uh, office and their names are Roberto Molina, Miriam Ochoa, and Leila Susana Remus Arriaga for the executive branch. And as uh, their deputies, other three magistrates were named, one for each branch of government. It should be observed that the appointments of the magistrates by the three agencies cannot be um, questioned. And also, uh, but they are still, they can still be questioned by the uh, Bar Association. There was a resolution by a court with regards to the constitutional action that granted an amparo against the university council and that suspended the sworn in, swearing, swearing in of uh, one of these members because there were remedies that had not still, that, that had not been solved yet. Now, during the third extraordinary session of the Congress, which occurred in June, 2021, after the remedies were solved, Nestor Mauricio Vasquez was sworn in for the Constitutional Court and Claudia Perez was sworn in as a deputy magistrate. The state of Guatemala says once again that it respects the legislation and as is uh, enshrined in our laws in all administrative procedures, due process should be observed.
In the document sent by the requesting party, it is expressed that even though the criminalization did not achieve the removal of the members of the court, some of them, some of them uh, had health issues, and one of them died, and another one suffered um, a stroke. Now, the former magistrate, Mr. Mejia Orellana, in that case, the court in August 2020 reported that Magistrate Mejia had communicated that he would take a leave of absence because he had tested positive for COVID. And afterwards, the Constitutional Court reported he had passed away. In the case of Mr. Aldana, the Constitutional Court informed that he would take um, he would leave the constitutional office with a medical diagnosis that stated that it was very unlikely that he would uh, be able to reincorporate in, in the following year and in those cases there's no link to the work they did at the at the constitutional court now on the election of magistrates on the appeal court and the supreme court the constitution the political constitution of our court establishes that the members of these courts are elected by the congress of the republic so the election process was started on february 2019 as established in our current legislation when through a uh, um, legislative agreement, the Congress asked for the integration of the candidates. Now, the creation of this commission is now being shown, so you can all see it. Because of a writ of amparo presented in September 2019 by the civil society organizations and a magistrate, the um, swearing was suspended, but it was supposed to take place within three months. Now on the screen, you can see uh, the uh, timeline of this process. The Congress issued its agreement 14-2020, which establishes the procedure for the election of magistrates of both courts in compliance with the um, ruling of the Constitutional Court issued under Amparo 1962, which has seven stages, as you can see on the screen starting with the reading to the uh, of the ruling until the actual list of candidates and an amparo was granted against the congress and the files were sent to the congress this uh, ruling also ordered congressmen to analyze the information and determine if the names revealed by the investigation are included in the regulation and in also in order to safeguard transparency during the plenary sessions the uh, representatives are supposed to express their vote in uh, with their voice explaining whether the uh, candidates meet the standards for the position and the time needed to comply with the seventh legislature of the court with 196 candidates and 160 congressmen. So 47,000 votes will have to take. Each of them will have to vote. And that would take weeks. That is why the Congress is meeting twice a week for example, to uh, interview ministries of the state. Now, the Congress needs to work to do its actual work at the same time, including the appointment of the courts. And that is why the Congress, which between 20 and 2020 and 2021 has included the issue of the election of magistrates of the Supreme Court in compliance with the Amparo ruling issued by the seventh magistrate's office Fifth, on the protection of magistrates, judges who are benefited by precautionary measures, the state of Guatemala, in accordance to its um, comp constitution, where it's supposed to protect its citizens and in compliance to the or with the orders of the Inter-American Commission, is uh, 
complying with these precautionary measures, as you can see on screen right now. Now, uh, for example, in our um, in the strategic plan we have for 2023, in order to um, fight crimes, in December 2019, the public prosecutor created an office against uh, an office for crimes against justice operators and union members, which investigates uh, the crimes committed against them when these crimes are committed in order to restrain their actions within their jobs. Now, the Ministry for Government is implementing the uh, protocol for the analysis of security measures through the um, security department, which assesses threats and the level of risk some magistrates and judges might be exposed to. Now, the head of the protection, the protection office is in charge of implementing security measures to protect the magistrates and their staff. The Ministry for Government between January and October 2021 has carried out several risk analyses and in 11 of them recommended uh, strengthened security measures. Right now, there are 46 personalized measures that are active and 43 of a perimetral uh, characteristic. Now, there are 175 police agents providing personalized security without counting those who are providing perimetral security services. Now, in order to protect judges and magistrates, we also passed through Agreement 35 2016, the creation of the uh, sec security for the institutions divisions to assess the process, processes and procedures to protect the president and the magistrates from the Supreme Court and other magistrates as well, as well as ensuring the security of all the members of the judicial branch. Now, in order to uh, protect magistrates and judges, there are agents from the national police, pilots, uh, protection vehicles and vests, patrol cars, weapons, and also the uh, Department of Security of the public prosecution has agents who provide personalized security to district uh, to state attorneys the state of guatemala continues to have open channels of communication with those who have received precautionary measures but at some point these benefic beneficiaries uh, don't attend the meetings they are invited to now sixth about the reports uh, of removal processes against judges and magistrates guatemala is a democratic state so the population has a right to file reports, and this cannot be restricted. But in order to prevent the abuse of these rights, there's a figure called pre-trial. Now, between 2016 and 2021, the Supreme Court received 51 pre-trial requests against uh, magistrates from the Constitutional Court. Many of them were rejected in limine. Two of them were not disclosed and one of them was added to another file. Two of them were sent to a different office and one was sent to the Congress. The pretrial requests were presented by several persons in exercise of their rights. Seventh, on the integration of the Supreme Court of Justice. The president of the Supreme Court, Mr. Mendez, appeared between the constitutional court of the seventh magistrate's office asking for a ruling with several questions, amongst them, if magistrates of the Supreme Court should continue to work and after October 2019, if their replacements had not been chosen, the court said they should based 
on what is established by Article 71 of the uh, Judicial Act, because magistrates cannot leave their positions until their replacements are elected, who in this case will replace them between 2019 and 2024. Then the Supreme of Court of Justice said that Mrs. Valdez Quesada should continue to be uh, as a justice of the Supreme Court until uh, her mandate was over. So the circumstances did not change. According to one of, of the, uh, the different articles and the different advisory opinion of the Constitutional Chamber uh, indicated how the composition of the Supreme Court should be. The state reaffirms the availability to keep an open dial with the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights by providing true information that is based without any ideological bias. And therefore, all the institutions of the state of Guatemala are open so that the petitioners can come to present any requests that they may have. I would like to conclude my exposition and the exposition of the state of Guatemala with this. Thank you. Thank you to the representatives of the state for uh, their presentation. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleagues first. I would like to give the floor to country rapporteur, Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena de Tritinio. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to greet to the representatives of the civil society that is here with us today. I also would like to greet judges and the human rights ombudsman and also the representatives of the state of Guatemala. This space is very important. This is a bridge in order to promote a dialogue that the state uh, ended up its presentation by emphasizing the importance of a dialogue, of a collective dialogue, of a constructive dialogue, an honest dialogue. We have two different positions in this hearing. They are quite different. And for the Inter-American Commission and in my capacity as a rapporteur, the goal of this hearing is to reach some consensus after listening to both parties. We should be able to have a find a roadmap, uh, to have a working roadmap in order to bring those two positions that are so different closer. And that's why I would like to ask both parties to provide us with detailed information uh, if that's possible, with regard to the measures. Um, the commission has been following up very closely the situation in Guatemala. And the commission has made several pronouncements on regarding its concern uh, about how this is difficult and complex issues being addressed. We need to preserve democracy and institutions. And that's why this is so important. And this is about the exercise of the role of judges and magistrates. So I would like to know your opinion regarding how effective those measures have been. The state has pointed out that those measures are effective. The petitioners of this hearing have said the opposite. And I would like to evaluate this and I would like to mention this information, 51 pre-trials and such a huge number of petitions of pre-trials indicates there is a situation of conflict. There is a real conflict there with the judicial system and the work conducted by the judges. So I would like to know how Judge Erika and what uh, prosecutor uh, Mr. Francisco, they presented uh, such a different situation. So I would like to know how the commission 
can help uh, you because we have one responsibility that is monitoring and conducting a follow-up regarding the compliance of the precautionary measures so that they are effective. And in addition, with regard to the situation of the selection processes in the judiciary, the petitioner said that that there are very important conflicts regarding the selection process of magistrates and judges and also the justices of the Supreme Court and the judges of the appeals court. Um, those are my questions, Madam President. I would like to indicate to both parties that the Inter-American Commission is interested in helping you find a profound, honest dialogue in order to build trust, not only for the petitioners, but also for the uh, society of Guatemala, so they can trust on the justice system. We understand how important judicial independence is not a guarantee for judges and prosecutors. It's a guarantee for citizens, they need to have a judicial body or a judicial system that is independent and autonomous. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, would it be possible to reply? Sorry, Mr. Ombudsman, you will have 12 minutes to reply to the state and to the commissioners. And the state will also have another 12 minutes. I would like to give the floor to the second vice president of the commissioner and to Commissioner Joel Hernandez. I don't know who would like to take the floor. Commissioner, thank you. Madam President, I fully agree with what has been expressed by my the country reporter, Commissioner Arosemena. And I would like to thank all of you for this hearing. I would like to hear it, to thank the petitioner organizations and also uh, for, I would like to thank the magistrates and the justice operators who requested this hearing. And also I would like to thank the state for providing us with a very uh, detailed explanation regarding how the processes are applied regarding the work of the judiciary and the public prosecutor office work. I would like to say that I have a concern and uh, my concern is that uh, it is unprecedented to have such a huge number of pretrials. Also, there is no precedent or there is no other record that shows that a justice operator needs to litigate to defend him or herself against allegations that are made because of their rulings and their judgments, that they are part of their work. One of the safeguards of in the, uh, judicial independence is not to be criminalized because of the acts or the actions that they take or the words that they pronounce. Um, therefore, this is a way of hindering the work of justice operators, presenting complaints and uh, different uh, mechanisms uh, prevents or hinders their work. Um, I think that the human rights ombudsman will be able, will be able to explain this, but uh, it's a concern that there are pretrial requests because of the work of the ombudsman. That's a question, and this that is a concern. There are 10 justice operators that are in exile right now. That is a concern. So that is what the commission is concerned about. And that's why we need to have this dialogue in order to understand the situation and to understand the reasons uh, for these actions and also 
it's important to understand what the guarantees are for justice operators so that they conduct can conduct their work without any threats or coactions. I would like to to hear the state reply in order to understand why there is such a high number of pre-trial re requests against justice operators. Especially, I would like to know about the institutions that exist in Guatemala to guarantee the compliance of the precautionary measures granted in favor of justice operators. I would like to know how the state works in this regard. And um, in this hearing, I would like to ask uh, Magistrate Erika Lorena, uh, who, uh, which has been, which uh, her experience has been with regard to the compliance of the precautionary measures granted by the commission uh, after the recommendations made by the commission re uh, in that precautionary measure. That's are my comments, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Commissioner Piovesan, you have the floor now. Thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon. Kind, I would like to greet kindly the civil society organizations. I would like to greet the human rights ombudsman, also their representatives of the state, and also the judges and magistrates that are present today. I agree with my colleagues, the country rapporteur, and with all their and with the comments made by the rapporteur for justice operators. Uh, I have the same concern because there are indicators uh, that show that there is a very, there is a context of erosion and weakening of judicial independence. There are 51 pre-trials. I'd like to stress that. Then we have 775 uh, attacks and 189 of them are against justice operators. So we are really concerned about this. And we have the press conference 273 slash 21 of the commission um, shows the concern of the commission in this regard, because we see that there are systematic attacks against judicial independence in Guatemala. I'm really concerned about what's happening because human rights cannot be guaranteed without in the, uh, judicial independence. And there are very precise uh, articles regarding access to justice and judicial independence and access to rights. In uh, This is present in articles eight and 25 of the American Convention. We have heard about retaliation, reprisals, surveillance, infiltrations, complaints, persecution, criminalization, political persecution, arbitrary detentions. So again, I think that it's very important to reinforce the importance of that press release of the commission, that this context or this situation should stop and I would like to stress what my colleagues have said. We need more information to see the measures or to know about the measures taken by the state to guarantee the implementation of the precautionary measures granted. I would like to hear the organizations and I would like to hear the state. So because it is necessary to have a roadmap, I think that the role of the commission is to create those spaces of con honest and constructive dialogue to promote the strengthening of judicial independence. And in that regard, my question is, which are your concrete proposals? One, regarding the guarantees for judges so that they can conduct their role uh, feeling safe. And also I would like to know about the constitutional guarantees because we have heard that here there are several mechanisms that are eroding 
judicial independence. So I think that this is a very important role that the commission has to play. We need to promote an agenda to strengthen judicial independence. That is the central element of the rule of law. No rule of law is possible without judicial independence. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Piovesan. I would like to ask Executive Secretary if she has any questions to ask. No, Madam President, thank you. I don't know if Maria Claudia, the Assistant Executive Secretary has any questions. Thank you, Madam President. It's a pleasure and an honor to have um, to have the possibility of participating in this hearing because of the quality and the roles of the persons that are participating in this hearing. I would like to give you some information. The concern that Commissioner Piovesan mentioned with regard to judicial independence as a central element of the rule of law is the transversal axis of the strategic plan to 2017-2022 of the commission. And we have been working on this a specific aspect across the region. Um, we have uh, one, uh, this will be one of the elements that we will be observing next year because we identified a similar situation in different countries of the region. And this is one of the central elements as Commissioner Piovesan was saying, um, the commission has been uh, following up the situation regarding judicial independence, uh, press releases and different in social media. And we are conducting a specific technical follow up through the commission's uh, follow up mechanisms. We are spe paying a special attention to this. So all information presented by civil society, by justice operators and by the state is very important. And Especially, uh, we would like to have information regarding the recommendations that have been formulated by the commission. That's all, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Claudia. To be honest, I have no questions. I think that my colleagues made all the questions uh, that were necessary. I would like to reiterate my concern and the concern of the commission regarding this situation of human rights in Guatemala and the situation of justice operators. This is a context that has been described by the country rapporteur, by Commissioner Flavia Poyosan, by Commissioner Joel Hernandez. We know that there are justice operators that had to leave the country. So there are a set of uh, facts that are happening that are worrisome. And I think that the international community is concerned about the impact of all these measures on judicial independence. As Commissioner Piavesan said, this is a central element in a rule of law and in de for democracy. So we believe that this hearing is very important and the information that you provide us with during your reply will be very important to have a comprehensive perspective of the situation. We have uh, indicated in our press releases that this is a situation that is a huge concern for the commission. So now I would like to give the floor to civil society organizations. You will have 12 minutes to answer. And after that, we would like to give the state 12 uh, additional minutes for their reply. Thank you, Madam President. I was paying a special attention to the representative of the state and how he recited formal aspects. But those aspects do not agree with reality. If we compare the case of Gloria Porras, the Congress said no, and we have the case of Myler Motto. And we don't know when they say yes and why they say no. Um, also, um, the parallel commission cases should, are still pending. And we know that one of these cases led to the outing of one of the judges. The United States is not a socialist or communist country. It's our main commercial partner. And they uh, are saying this. So, and they are warning us that maybe that after these judges, the next ones could be another one. So we are seeing that this an escalation and we are going to end up all in Washington, but that decision is not an easy one to make. And we hope we don't have to make that decision. I'm really concerned 
of the silence of the representatives of the state. And because you don't talk about the budget, uh, by November, we won't have money because the Congress has decided not to transfer the funds. Uh, you know that the Constitutional uh, Court in February this year said that the funds should be there, but you are not doing that. You are not responding or complying with that order. So what are you expecting? So please, representatives of the state, you should invite the commission to, to conduct a field visit here. And it should be now, not too late, because otherwise we will have more conflicts. We are complaining about the situation in Nicaragua or in Colombia, but we still have time. And commissioners, you should pronounce on this very strongly. I have several measures and we would like to give you some instruments so you can work in an independent way, but I don't have the money. And that's a problem. So representatives of the state, you should invite the commission uh, to a field visit. That would be very healthy. Thank you for this space that you are providing. I would like to make reference to some of the situations that were listed by the state of Guatemala during their intervention. Those actions address uh, the creation of the FESI, but that's not right. The prosecutors and the members of that uh, FESI unit, we were all members of the public prosecutor office. Prosecutor Mr. Solis was the one who signed the agreement and the change in the name of the prosecutor office was conducted by Claudia Fasi Paz when she signed as general attorney. And what Consuelo Porras did is to prepare an agreement so as to guarantee that the public prosecutor office was going to be able to continue working, let's say. So what the state is saying is incorrect you copy all the information from the website of the public prosecutor office. And there you just copy and paste the list of all the officials that were included. But to be honest, all those people were members already of the public prosecutor office. They, that is another mistake or another lie of the public prosecutor office. If the state of Guatemala was willing to strengthen the public prosecutor office, they would have made reference to all the unjustified transfers, all the unjustified promotions that were aimed at uh, removing uh, skilled personnel and to include personnel that is close to them. And that is just a strategy to dismantle the FESI. And that's why we see that there are serious actions that are being conducted to dismantle the Human Rights Prosecutor Office. And because of the petition of some uh, actors, Prosecutor Fiscal Pineda was removed from her position. I can give you a set of uh, articles and regulations and provisions of the constitution. But I would not be able to justify as the state of Guatemala, how a public prosecutor can be removed from his or her position uh, in spite of having complied with the parameters. I wouldn't, I have you did not hear what the United Nations said regarding the removal of prosecutors. I could say that I present some complaints before some instance, but what uh, you are doing with me and what you are doing at the public prosecutor office is a set of arbitrary actions. Thank you. Good morning, uh, commissioners. Thank you for allowing me to uh, sh share with you my personal experience in the hearings that we have with the state of Guatemala. 
I would like to say that I believe that the state of Guatemala did not comply with the precautionary measures that you granted and that those hearings were not effective. And that's why I requested provisional measures now. I would like to try to summarize the, the reasons why I think that those hearings have not been effective so far. The first reason, as uh, the honorable commissioners already know, was the fact that one of the hearings was uh, held two years after the granting of the precautionary measures. I, there were only a few hearings. And if I'm not wrong, there were only three hearings that were held. And sometimes I, I have not been able to be there. So in some of them, uh, my representatives were there. And on, for another, I informed that I was not going to be present. But the state of Guatemala just informs me about the hearings two or three days before the date in which they are going to be held. And I have a working schedule and it's busy. And I also need to have the authorization to the state of Guatemala in order to be able to participate in those hearings. So if they notify about the hearings with such a short notice that uh, prevents me from being able to uh, be present at those hearings. Um, the first hearing was just to have some information and the other hearings were just there to listen to me. And after the first meeting, there were two agreements. They were going to prepare a new risk analysis. And I have expressed my concern before the commission because the state of Guatemala is trying to find information regarding my personal security uh, scheme. And I know that this that risk is real because the um, representative of one of the bodies of the state shared two videos uh, letting everybody know about my security scheme. I requested a change in my security scheme because of the risk that I face because my security scheme is now publicly known and I hadn't received no positive uh, response. The risk analysis of the state is contradictory still. The risk analysis prepared by the judicial body says that my risk is high and the report prepared by the Ministry of Governance said that my risk is middle. So in spite of the agreement uh, requesting a professional risk analysis, the state has not complied with that. The second agreement was about the presence of the public prosecutor office because we believe that the office is being used to criminalize justice operators. And you may reference to the high number of pretrials. They are being processed, they are still pending, but that number is higher because many of these uh, complaints have been dismissed because they have no legal basis or these pre-trial requests were had no basis so they have been rejected the hearings that i mentioned before are a way of victimizing myself so i requested the state of guatemala to receive copies of the schedules and of all the information and they have denied that information to me for all the reasons that I mentioned, I believe that the hearings are not effective. And for that reason, I have requested before the Honorable Commission to consider the petition of, uh, to consider my petition for provisional measures. Thank you. Okay, I will address in a few words, an issue that we believe um, comprehends everything we have exposed. And it's that link between the uh, ownership of the state, the criminalization and the dismantling of the institutional protection mechanisms. 
For the past two years, the Congress of the Republic has not chosen high courts in the country, disobeying a resolution from the Constitutional Court. But, th but that appropriation of the state allows them to use all these criminalization reports uh, so that they continue to go on. And in the meantime, human rights defenders and justice operators are restrained and continually harassed. So I would um, say that it is important to understand that this vicious circle is part of a series of attacks against justice operators where the uh, government is criminalizing but apart from that, it's also using disciplinary mechanisms to sanction and harass justice of, of the operators. And there's a lack of adequate mechanisms to ensure the protection of the life and integrity of justice operators. The use of the media and social media to uh, harass them and also the complaints presented against them. So when we see this um, institutional appropriation, that is the environment justice operators are facing. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank the representatives of the civil society and the ombudsman and the public officials. Now I will give the floor to the representatives of the state so that they can answer our observations as well. You have 12 minutes. We would like to emphasize on the attention to the complaints they have argued that have been uh, presented. That has to do with the fact that the state of Guatemala respects the right to petition of all citizens, not just a sector. Now, with regards to precautionary measures, um, in order to discuss them through the uh, Com Presidential Commission for Human Rights and Peace, the beneficiaries were invited to discuss the issue. Judges Eric Caifan, Judge Tipi Moore, Judge Jasmine Barrios, but they failed to attend. Now we are proposing a new appointment on November 9th, but Judge Erika Aifan has not replied whether she um, accepts this appointment. Now, with regards to what the Ombudsman for Human Rights just said, with regards to uh, budget, it's not that we kept quiet. We only respect the fact that this was not in the agenda for today's hearing. Now, with regards to the issues of the judiciary, I will give the floor to the representative from the Supreme Court, Mr. Miguel Estuardo Avila. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Now, with regards to the issues that were discussed, I saw there's a concern with regards to pre-trials. And for this, I would like to clarify a couple of points that were not elaborated. I will try to be as brief as possible with regards to pre-trials. The state of Guatemala, in accordance to our constitution, guarantees all of its inhabitants justice and also freedom to act and also the right of petition and free access to justice courts. The warranty, or in this case, the um, figure of the pre-trial is, is decided so that the functioning of the uh, court is not suspended. There is a law for pretrials, Executive Order 85202, which establishes the procedure by which the pretrials are supposed to be carried out. And, it's, and it establishes that this will be determined by the Supreme Court of Justice when uh, this is necessary. Otherwise, it might be rejected in limine when this has to do with illegitimate or political uh, reasons. Over 80% of these pretrials did not uh, move forward because in the function of the Supreme Court in before 
Moving on with the proceeding for with the pretrial, the court examined the files, it performed an analysis and determined whether these uh, proceedings should move forward or not. So 41 pre-trials were rejected in limine. So those uh, persons who uh, were subjected to pre-trials did not even have to uh, attend uh, citation, a citation. So the Supreme Court determined that these pre-trials were not supposed to go on. And this has to do with due process and also the presumption of innocence. All inhabitants of the uh, Republic of Guatemala are entitled to. So I can mention the Honorable Commission. I can tell the Honorable Commission that the um, system of Guatemala is respectful of due process. And this can be seen in the fact that we comply with Executive Order 852002, which is the act for free trials and the different decisions issued by the Constitutional Court in its different offices in terms of the proceeding the court should use so that uh, it won't be just another step in the proceeding because as Supreme Judges, they can establish whether a pretrial is pertinent or not and can determine whether uh, these pretrials are uh, based on illegitimate or political reasons. This is with regards to pretrials. Um, in order to go on with our reply, I will give the floor to the public attorney, to the state attorney. Thank you, commission, honorable members of the commission and everyone attending this hearing. I think we have explained in a clear manner what concerns the commission in terms of the situation of the legal or judicial system in Guatemala. And I share what was mentioned by distinguished commissioner Arosa Mena with regards to the fact that there's a grave concern for uh, preserving democracy and its institutions. And that is why the state of Guatemala demands the respect for those institutions. And definitely what cannot be negotiated is a transgression of the processes that um, rule the way we address the situations in our daily lives. As my predecessor on the floor said, with regards to the law for pretrials, which states that the right to a pretrial is a guarantee for those who work at the service of the state to preserve the stability of the performance in their positions and ensure the exercise of their public work, but restraining the possibility of a citizen being able to express their non-conformity with legal actions is not negotiable because as a state, our duty is to our citizens and we must try to find that balance. When we talk about criminalization, what do we mean? We mean the uh, way uh, there's a, there are claims about the restriction of free thought and action in legal proceedings. We cannot restrain that, Honorable Commission. Of course, our duty is to our citizens. We work for our citizens and we are aware that all of us as public officials are bound by the law. None of us, none of those who are members of these um, offices are above the law. None of us. We are all subjected to the system and we can all be held accountable. The state has complied and has 
determined security schemes and details. If that is what's not expected by some persons, well, that is why our honorable commissioner is explaining that we are inviting these persons to determine the schedules. Now, the fact that they are not participating is something that goes beyond our scope. But nevertheless, we do our best to comply. At some point, we talked about well, the fact that uh, arbitrary detentions are occurring was mentioned. Now, if we could perform an analysis with regards to the uh, prison orders generated within processes, we could determine that in accordance to our law and the arguments of our operators, we always work for freedom. But the state attorney in the case will be the one who shall determine the existence of procedural risks. But that is something that needs to be analyzed on a case by case basis. But in some cases, freedom is not prioritized, prioritized and some persons are subjected to preemptive prison for far longer than the law establishes. Yes, but this is a situation where the executive branch and its institutions cannot do anything because the executive branch cannot um, intercede in the uh, decisions of the judiciary. Of course, we agree with the concerns, but as my predecessor mentioned, complaints have been dismissed. The honorable professionals who uh, presented this hearing have discussed, have mentioned that many um, complaints have been dismissed. Many pre-trials were rejected in limine. That is why I was saying that it is impossible to negotiate the vulneration or of the procedures established by our law. Now, with regards to uh, what was mentioned by the appropriation of the state and the processes of criminalization, I think this should be a forum for consensus, not politics. So when there are objective facts that can be discussed and that are documented, I think that should be on the table so that we can create a link. Right now, we are discussing clear issues and we need to be serious in the debate to which we were invited. So as a state, we understand the concern, but we also uh, presented our proof and we did not recite anything. We are showing the actions that the state of Guatemala has implemented to warranty judges their independence and their security. Thank you very much, honorable members of the commission and everyone here at this hearing. Thank you very much, everyone, for the information you have presented and also for the statements of the civil society. I would like to repeat once again um, the concern of our commission with regards to the current situation. I believe it's very important, first of all, considering one of the last interventions of the states, the fact that some of the persons who have received precautionary measures that are they are not attending the meetings, we insist on the importance of dialogue. Precautionary measures uh, need to be complied with and trust is required here. I would like to um, point out how important that is. Dialogue is very important, but also trust, spaces for trust are very important. We have seen that is very important after what we heard at this hearing. And I would also like to make a call to the state with regards to the situation we've been following up about the budget for the Ombudsman's Office for Human Rights. We understand the uh, state did not 
present information now, but we would like to point out the importance of this office because of uh, its work in the um, um, in the rule of law and because of the importance of what the state has mentioned and also those who were part of the proceeding um i would like to say that the commission is at the disposal of the state to carry out a working visit to guatemala in order to facilitate dialogue address this issue and understand on the ground what the current situation is. I am sure that the country rapporteur would be available to go as soon as the um, state accepts this. So of course, our commission is at your disposal and we would like to join you in these processes to join the state and justice operators in order to bridge the gaps and understand um, the context in a clearer manner. I think working visits allow us to establish uh, roadmaps. So I think I would like to formally express our interest in the fact that this could occur very soon. Thank you very much to all those who have attended this hearing. We will stay in touch at the disposal of both parties to keep on working on these issues or other issues that are within the mandate of the commission. Thank you very much. Goodbye.